Welcome to Open Talk, an ongoing discussion of the state of photography in the age of COVID-19. I'm Travis Keyes, your host, also a photographer, a New Yorker, a Sony shooter, and chairman of American Photographic Artists New York. Each week I'll be joined by a diverse panel to talk about where we came from, where we're at, and where we may be going. We do these broadcasts live so you can participate and ask questions. Then you go out. So I, I don't know what's happening there. Well, it's a virtual background. Okay. It's virtual and we're going live. So <laughs> and welcome to Open Talk episode 12, which is kind of crazy to say episode 12 that uh, we've been kind of doing this isolation and show for you know almost 12 weeks now. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, have two guests on tonight. It's rare that you get uh, one guest that is accomplished, let alone two guests that are as accomplished, and you could have a full discussion about their career, and they're not even halfway probably through their career. They're just uh, budding. And um, the first guest is Benjamin Lowy, and the second is Marvy Lacar. I want to welcome you guys to the show. What's going on, guys? Oh, hey. I'm feeling very tropical today. I, I, like, I like the shirt. It works for me. It absolutely works for me. I, I love the whole background. And I, obviously, we'll get into that picture because I know it's one of yours. Um, I don't know if you actually know where we first met. It was a long time ago when I just started really getting into the photography world. We were shooting, uh, hired to shoot at Sotheby's to, to shoot the Andy Warhol, which was going to be the, the biggest sale yeah. of a, and uh, I'm, I was told, I'm like, oh, Ben Lowy's going to be shooting. I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> I didn't know. That was like in what, like 2013 or something. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, it was. It was. Oh, it was, was one. Of, it was Deep Mars. But it was one of those those years where it was like it was famine, and and I remember like oh, because we had just moved to me. We had moved here, and we were like, I was taking any type of job I could possibly get just to like. <laughs> You know, make we were selling cameras just to we, pay mortgage. Yeah, all, <laughs> all, yeah, because all our savings went to oh my God. a house for the first time. But it, and it was also right when there was a downturn in work, and um, I just would disappear. Uh, <laughs> where did I go? Um, you know, I love, I love how you go swimming off into the deep blue ocean. Yeah, but it, <laughs> it, it, it was definitely. Um, I remember, I remember doing that job and not knowing what the hell we were photographing. It was just yeah, like, it was wild. So they thought they were going to get the highest sale ever on this Warhol, and then I was brought in to just kind of bring uh, uh, with another person, and uh, we had to get the shot of the gavel coming down the first row of it like the the big shot so the night before i had to go up on a cherry picker mount cameras up on the ceiling and hope that they were still active the next day to get that shot and because the room was going to be full the next day so i would never be there i remember you going around doing all the candid shots i think that's pre-sony for you even because i think i remember that was that was uh you know canon yeah, yeah. And you were, you know, you had some little Fuji in your hand. You were getting all little close oh, shots of yeah, everybody. Yeah. I used yeah. to love it. It was like the F100X. Yeah, yeah. I've never, I've always loved that camera and I'm not allowed to use it anymore. <laughs> but it, there's still nothing that replaces that kind of small hey, little. Not I know, I know. Well, they don't make anything like that. But I mean, well, I'm not using it. What's, what's amazing is we're all part of sort of this big Sony family. And that's, uh, I, I've been lucky enough to, you know, sit down uh, and hear your, your, your wife talk. And it is so inspirational. And I'm so happy to have you both on here today. Because for me, uh, I only found photography about six or seven years ago and became a professional. And it changed my life. And I know, Marvy, you say how photography saved your life. And I want to go into that later. And how how important that was to you. And it, I, for me, it was, it's, it's a different type of important, but it saved my life too. Uh, so I want to dive into that. So I'm so psyched to have you guys and let's dive right into it. Uh, first questions. Where did you both grow up? You want to go first? Well, I'm second guest. You're, you're, you're so. second no, guest. You're, you're, you're both first guest. Actually, you're top build Marvy on the, on the, on the sheet. So <laughs> why don't you go first? <laughs> Where did I only you? met Ben first. I only have one answer. You have like, multiple. <laughs> Yeah, it's very hard for me to answer that question. But let's just say I was born and raised in the Philippines. Um, but then I found myself in Michigan when I was 15. Kalamazoo, of all places. Kalamazoo, Michigan. With Derek Jeter. Right. I went to school with Derek Jeter. <laughs> yeah. We all have someone, right? And Ben, where'd you grow up? I grew up in, in New York. You're so a New Yorker, right? In the city or was it suburbs or where was it? In Queens. In the Queens. City. Queens, baby. Nice. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you grew up in New York. When did you guys both kind of find photography? Was it early on? Was it, uh, did you have another job? Was it a second, you know, third job finding? How did you first get that camera? What was your first camera? And how did you find that love for photography? Uh, I took a photo one class, I think my junior year of college, or 
sophomore year of college and, and like really fell in love with it. I w went to school for illustration and uh, at some point I, you know, became enamored with it. I was photographing models so I could do better drawings and tracing them and found James Noctaway's book Inferno and it really kind of inspired me. And then, you know, took a year off from school and started, you know, sent myself to Israel and going into the West Bank and, and really kind of training myself to be a conflict photographer. I very much got into photography to be a documentary kind of conflict photographer. Um, my first camera, the very first camera for, for my, um, uh, you know, photo one class was like some Pentax. I don't even remember the number. It was like a, it was like a Pentax 35 millimeter cheap film camera that <laughs> got from B&H. And then I, I was there, was there one camera before that even like your very, very first camera you remember? Like I remember having a 110. <laughs> I mean, that was my first camera when I got into photography. I, I think when I was like seven or eight or something like that, uh, my mom's, boyfriend at the time had gifted me like a, a Polaroid camera. That's your first camera. Now don't you ever put it down. <laughs> I definitely don't have that one anymore. Yeah. And, and how about you, you Marby? Um, well, I'm Filipino. So naturally my only options were in medicine and law. Um, and, uh, so I was in a pre-med track and I was in, um, uh, foreign study in Spain and you know when you're in foreign study you don't really study as much as you're Drink. just in a foreign place <laughs> not studying uh, and I I was in the museum and I found Sebastián Salgado's work and I fell in love with it and I always knew I wanted to be in some some sort of um, service-oriented work you know I it was either in medicine or in some sort of nonprofit. And I thought photojournalism was a way where you can somewhat do kind of that, you know, talking about the truth. Um, the truth is now in quotes nowadays because <laughs> people find the truth to be just whatever it is to be. Um, but um, uh, I thought photojournalism was a way where I can still do art because I was really, I really loved art. I actually, my my scholarship in school, I had a scholarship, I had a full ride for math and science, but I had an additional scholarship for art. So I actually, when I wasn't in math or science, I would actually be in the art department painting. And so I kind of, it kind of married both worlds for me. There's a very distinct look to both of your, your, your photography uh, and, and you're very empathetic people. And Ben, one of the things that attracts me to what you do is you seem to always look for an angle that shouldn't be possible or, you know, something that's outside the realms. Was that something, did you have influences? Was it growing up in television or cinema or you just was like, you know, that's their photographer standing there. I'm going to go and climb under a bridge and get a different vantage point. What was it? How did you kind of develop a style or do you even think it's your style? It's just you. Yeah, no, it's definitely my style. I think, um, you know, I grew up, my mom is an artist, my grandmother is an artist. Um, I very early on knew I was gonna be an artist. It was gonna be comic book drawing, which is what I originally wanted to do. And one of the interesting things about comic books and the way you prepare yourself as an artist is you always read the script first. So you understand what the, um, what the story's about. And you, you know, because when you draw comic books, the angle could be whatever, wherever you want it. You're not, um, hampered by placing a camera or obstacles and so you can really dream of photographing any angle you can dream of batman from a bird's eye view from a ant's eye view from the side with perspective and so it's really a way to think about how you're planning out a shot yeah and um i i think marvie gave me the greatest com compliment ever and, and and she doesn't realize how much i take this to heart but she was like it was, it was what we were together when we were shooting. And she was like, you know, Ben, you will sit still and take hundreds of photos of the same thing until you get exactly what you want. And I think I'm, you know, when it comes to photography and probably nothing else, I'm ultimately like really, really patient. Like yeah. I, I sort of like, I make the photograph in my head. I know what I want to get. And I will sit there and sit there and sit there until I can make it. 
And so I won't ever just take for hours. Like for me, it's like (laughs) sketching, like in the same way you sketch a drawing, like you begin the process. So I keep on photographing, figure like through photographing, I figure out what I want. And then I keep on doing it until I get what I think the image should be. And then in terms of going to a different place, David Burnett, a long time ago, probably in like 2002, gave me the best advice. He was like, if you see a flock of photographers photographing this one place, you know, just walk somewhere else, do something else, because they're already at that angle. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but like, it's good advice to just go to a different position. And, and Marvy, you're, you're so connected emotionally. And I know you, you've probably gone a long route to get there what what was your photo route from what you started shooting to getting to the emotional place now and do you when you're looking to shoot now is it more like what drives you is the emotional tie to it or is it uh, you know the scene or are you story you know planning it out ahead of time what's your how are you approaching it because you're very different yeah and i i shoot very differently from ben i think ben really uh Obviously, the composition is a component, right? But I don't um, start from there at all. Um, I have always been, uh, I have always been attracted to stories. You know, I grew up in the Philippines, like I said, and where I grew up in the province that I grew up uh, back in 70s, in the 70s, I guess, mid 70s. You're old. I'm old. You're old. Um, you know, TVs weren't but that beautiful. Big, of a, big of a thing. Um, there was radio. So, you know, the art of storytelling, what is really something I grew up with. Um, and that's how I learn. I learn how to, you know, how you evoke emotion with music, with, with, with rhythm um, and intonation. And that's just how I, I feel photography as well. I don't have the same art background that Ben has. And in a way, I think it's good because I never kind of tried to, you know, when you start in photography, you start mimicking all these other people that you studied. I don't even know if I really had that as much because I'm not a byline person. Uh, One of the jokes between Ben and I is my first question to him was who is Ben Lowy like I don't even know who Ben Lowy is and because he was talking about <laughs> but you will <laughs> but he was talking about himself in third person at that point and I was like I don't know who you are um and I still don't retain bylines to this day I still don't really retain bylines um but I'll remember an image for how it makes me feel yeah so that's how I've always approached images and then you know obviously with the composition that comes, the more you practice, right? The, you know how to align things, you know what, how to, how to expose correctly and what really to focus on. That's all secondary to me. I think I've always been, you know, where is the situation where the emotions are really authentic and how do I place myself in that situation? And then we can take it from there. And I think that's why we're a really good team is because I come from this aesthetic side to the content and Marvy comes from the content to the aesthetic and we kind of meet in the middle and figure out, you know, how- There's a lot of bickering in between. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) So before I jump into, uh, you know, some of the pictures that you sent me and and, uh, we share that, uh, how did you guys actually meet in the first place? That's oh a long God. story. Yeah. That's like an hour and a half we, long. All right, well, well, that'll be that'll be open talk fifteen or, or twenty five. We'll, 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 we'll go back to that one on the on the on the reunion yeah, special. Our first date was at a Starbucks. Well, no, it was a first meet. It was a first. Was meet. at one of the few Starbucks locations that have gone out of business, and it's now a shoe store. I I I saw him and I I chatted with him and I and listened then to me. I listened to him, but I didn't know that all three of them were the same people. Oh, wow. Yeah, we had an original conversation but this is very online. Long. So let's move on. Yeah. And let's then and then on. she was listening to me at Eddie Adams, but puking outside the main room. So, I so never she didn't that. see me. <laughs> um, but yeah. So we're going to dive into uh, some of the stuff that you guys have sent me. And uh, um, we're going to start off with this one right here. Why don't you tell me about this one? Uh, well, that is... Um, kind of titled Blue Man. Um, And I made that kind of the day that the war ended uh, in Iraq in 2003. I was driving a car and 
uh, Lindsay Adario had let me borrow her 20 millimeter lens, which on the Nikon D1Xs at that time was like, uh, or it was a 14 millimeter lens. So it was a 20 or something like that. Um, and I just photographed this guy jumping off a bridge into the Tigris River. It was like a 105 degree day. He was just going swimming. But uh, it sparked a lot of conversation when I sent it into time. Um, and when it was published, a lot of people asked questions about the nature of what was happening. Like, I think because there's uh, a history of lynching photography in this country, a lot of people put a kind of nefarious viewpoint as to what was happening. Right. And it kind of, I mean, I don't know, lucky I think that this happened within like the first six months of my professional career was that it kind of opened my eyes to the idea that a really strong aesthetic for an image uh, can break through to the audience and then deliver the content, which is why, which is why that's what I do right now is this whole idea of creating a strong aesthetic or what I hope is a strong aesthetic to kind of bypass the, I wouldn't call it apathy, but mm -hmm. like, like, but like so many people we see like close to 6,000 images a day and how do you parse that? So I hope that, you know, by creating these strong Im aesthetic images, things that, you know, can draw the eye and then get through to the audience. So that, that happened to me early in my career. And that was really important transition point for me. Yeah. I mean, it's it, obviously a striking image and, uh, and then we go into this, which is sort of your. I mean, that's that was my bread and butter for years. Is is sort of photographing the war, um, and I think I learned more about myself as a human being and where I wanted to be while I was photographing war. I mean, I photographed war for about ten years, and but the effects of it didn't really hit you. You know that idea so, that war. <clears throat> funny. Obviously, you kind of th th this was in your very early mindset that you wanted to be a conflict photographer and wartime photographer. I, I, that takes a different breed of person entirely. What do you think was going on in your head that you're like, all right, I know I can cope with, you know, seeing this, or did you even think you could cope with seeing death? And, um, and, I, and I, I always knew, uh, let me put, um, I knew I could, and I don't know why I knew I could. I mean, I grew up in New York in the 1980s and I, I saw a bunch of stuff and I, uh, I don't know if that's why, but sometimes you're familiar with who you are as an individual and it, uh, it takes a little bit of maturity. And I don't necessarily know that I had that, but I know that um, somehow, you know, when I started documentary work that I was okay with, with seeing that stuff. And to be honest, maybe I'm not because it comes back to haunt you in many ways. Yeah. I'm going to go back to just quickly so we can talk about this, the, the hooded, the person. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, I was with, um, uh, I believe it was the 101st airborne and, you know, going through and um, I, th I believe this is to Crete um, in 2003 and, um, arresting suspected Bath Party members uh, on different raids and bomb makers. Um, and I made, I, you know, I, I uh, was lucky enough to go out on a lot of different raids at night and not lucky enough, but I was given the opportunity. Um, and there was a time before, I think, and this is before, um, you know, Abu Ghraib and, and stuff like that, where th there was a little bit more open to photographing things that today is, is, is much more difficult to photograph during an embed and where you're stopped many yeah. times from doing that. But, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think I realized is, you know, I was really young and most of the soldiers were my age. I was 23 and, yeah. you know, you're, you're, your blood is boiling and you, you're supposed to, your friends, you know, I was young enough that I thought I was friends with a lot of the soldiers and I was, but, and I think, you know, sometimes you see what they do from their perspective rather than separating yourself out. And I think that only comes from the maturity that comes from. And I'm sure there's, there's, you never quite have that bond because they've gone through boot camp and they've gone through all this together and that there's that brotherhood. And once I'm sure you go through a situation with them that, that changes, but right. it, there must be something 
uh, how quickly did you find yourself changing? And like, did you go over, come back and then instantly like the adrenaline aspect of it want to immediately go back or did you need to decompress and then kind of sort it and then go back? It depended on the year. It really did. And sometimes I wanted to go back right away and I did. Sometimes I was home and I was antsy and sometimes I just didn't want to go back. I mean, it yeah. really depended on the year. And I think getting into a relationship with Marvy changed a lot of it. Ultimately and then, and then changed, everything, I mean, right? it changed everything. But yeah. Um, and this image is from Afghanistan in the old Russian cultural center, which isn't there anymore, but it used to be a home to about 2000 daily heroin addicts, mm. uh, free base heroin. Uh, and I saw this, it was a bullet hole or a mortar hole in the wall. And because there was so much secondhand heroin smoke in this room, you had this really crazy ray of light. And I showed up at five in the morning when the ray of light was going completely horizontal and I just waited there until it moved and moved and came down. And then I realized um, I was completely high <laughs> <laughs> after five hours of shooting in this environment. Did you see a progression in the photos? Did they change? <laughs> no, no, I was completely <laughs> lightheaded and, you know. So uh, obviously you've, you've shot a lot of conflict and, and seen amazing things. And now you're shooting stuff uh, with, with COVID and, and seeing that. Are there, are there correlations you see or feel or is there anything? Is it totally different or how are you seeing these two things? Because a lot of people are dying here and it's not the same as a war, but people are dying. Well, I, I think, um, and it actually plays to this image. Um, I photographed some e-waste when I was in Ghana. And I, I think sometimes we turn the kind of Western privileged eye when we're photographing in wars in different places. Or here I was, you know, photographing all these kids who were uh, internal refugees in Ghana working in these e-waste dumps. But you don't have the same connection. And because you have this, you know, it's this white Western privileged mentality that you get to turn your vision on a foreign place yeah. uh, where it is harder to do at home and where you're actually kept from doing it at home, uh, where there are more law, like, you know, it's more restrictions because of privacy laws, but more than that, you get, no one expects you to photograph, you know, it's the same like every photo one student I've ever worked with on their first roll of film always takes a picture of a homeless man. Yeah. yeah. Because it's so easy and it's an other and it's there. And I, I, I think going through these images, and I don't even have these on my website anymore it is, is because I kind of learned this lesson that I can't do that and it's cliche and it's time to move beyond that. Yeah. And, and this one, obviously, I mean, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's bullet holes. Yeah, no, this was in Libya. This was in Gaddafi's, uh, um, house in Tripoli and, and his compound. And I mean, this kind of marked this, you know, um, another progression where I was shooting with the iPhone and I really started doing it in Afghanistan. And I did a couple of projects there for the New York Times Magazine where Kathy Ryan is great, where she published this giant 12 page spread in the magazine just with my iPhone work, which I think really brought, um, you know, iPhone into, um, you know, the, the, the forefront. And then, yeah you know, I started using it more. And in Libya, I was, you know, I was in Benghazi and uh, in Tripoli and all these different places. And I started shooting with the iPhone and then transmitting it from the field and using social media. At the time, it was Tumblr uh, to really, to really push stuff in real time. Sounds like you have PTSD. How do you cope with it now? A lot of therapy. Uh, I, I, I take a lot of medication. Now, um, <laughs> a lot of medication. A lot of therapy. Um, I, I like work out religiously. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm kind of swole. Um, but I mean, part of that is to sort of balance out what goes in, it, it, what goes on in my mind or yeah. anger or frustration that can build up. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very open about it, how I have PTSD and how, um, it has affected me deeply in many ways. But that, that would lead me to two questions then. Uh, one, it, did you find yourself uh, having an inner dialogue, at, I'm sure more than one point, saying, uh, I'm in too deep, I, I'm not getting out of this one? <laughs> like, uh, um, there are a couple of instances where I really thought that it was really close and I might have, have died, um, but it was only after the fact. 
Um, and I think somewhere along the line, you live through it because you kind of approach it, you detach yourself in the same way you look through a camera and it's very much a shield because you're looking through the camera. So you're not really seeing it with your own eyes. And I, I think there's a way where emotionally that detaches you from who you're photographing, but it also detaches you from putting yourself in the scene and realizing, uh, you know, case in point, you know, when, when, you know, things are exploding in front of me and I'm just like, Oh, that's a cool picture. You know, and I'm, I'm, yeah. looking, you know, and, um, but there were definitely some times where I, I remember I had called Marvy when I was um, in the trunk of a car uh, being <laughs> smuggled out of, of uh, Kirkuk. Um, and I just called her to say, I like, I love you and I'll talk to you later. Cause I really thought I was going to die. When um, you got that call, Marvy, did you know like, Oh shit. Or was it just like, oh, he's in the trunk of a car? <laughs> no, I, I didn't tell her. I didn't oh, okay. tell her. <laughs> I have even been bitchy towards him or something. That's, I, that's, that's like a normal <laughs> conversation. So, yeah, I probably was, like, snappy. Like, I have stuff to do. Like, you can tell me yeah. later when you're back or whatever. I, I don't know. So um, seeing, seeing stuff like this, it can't not change you. What, what, what do you think uh, do you carry with you that you try to remind yourself every day from this? And how did it change you? You know, I'm still, uh, I don't know if I'll ever go back to war photography or, or, or like kind of, I, I'm still into documentary work, though I think nobody really thinks about me in terms of uh, doing documentary work because I've, I've diversified so much over the last few years. But that's, it's still very much something that's close to my heart. But I think one of the things that I came to grips with um, later on in, in terms of going through therapy. Um, you know, my very, the reason I, I, my career really blossomed was like on the first day of like the war in Iraq, I didn't have an assignment when I photographed the grenade attack in Camp Pennsylvania. I was 23, it was my first round the world, time hired me for six months after that. And as I look back, I realize that my entire career began with the deaths of, of of, of another human being. Yeah. And, um, and in fact, as a war photographer and a lot of people, a lot of, uh, you know, colleagues that may not think this is the best thing to say, but as a war photographer, you need people to die. You need war in order to be a war photographer. You don't go to Iraq or Afghanistan saying, I hope nothing happens. Yeah. Because then you don't make any photographs, right? You, it's almost like you're waiting for people to die to make photographs to say dying is bad. And that's why and I bring up that almost that like adrenaline junkie kind of feel. Like you have to get that rush. You got to get that feel. You got to get that story. You got to, you know, and that's what you're going for. Right. And, and, and I, I think when I realize like, oh, I, I paid, you know, my rent or, I, you know, I can send my kids to swim lessons because I made money photographing you know, mothers crying over their dead babies. Yeah. And, and, and I think that was something that took a long time for me to realize and come to grips with. So let's jump out of wartime here and uh, talk about this photo. Um, the guy in the center on the right wrestled me first. He had <laughs> 60 pounds on me and he destroyed me, but I, I really got into doing sports photography, but mostly fighting sports and then eventually wrestling because I thought it was really interesting that wrestling has kind of two origins. And one was um, training soldiers to fight without killing them and in Greece. Uh, and then one was, uh, you know, shepherds in what is now Sudan, uh, you know, wrestling over who's, you know, if cows got mixed up in different flocks, like they would wrestle over it. And so that was conflict resolution. And yeah. I thought it was really interesting that this is the world's earliest sport is wrestling. And one was developed for war and one was developed in a way for peace. And I thought that was really interesting, especially coming from war photography to kind of yeah. go into that. You're, you're now now we're, we're going to turn it over to, to, to you, Marvy the way you deal with family and being so honest about yourself and exposing that, how do you, how do you get to that place where you feel it's okay or where to let yourself understand 
you've been hurt and you can talk about it and share that because most people want to hide that away and you're exposing it for the world to see. How do you get to that point? Well, I think it was a, a there's a skip, right? Um, so we're skipping straight to, this is actually not my, the work that, um, like I got into, this is more yeah. personal work that I have. So I started in photo journalism, but then I got sick. My father died, died. And we had, you know, we had a very difficult relationship. Um, and I remember I was actually clinically depressed and Ben had to commit me. Yeah. So he had to take me to the hospital and I stopped talking for a little bit. And Ben said, why don't you photograph this? You're not going to photograph, you know, you're not going to talk about this, write about it. Um, so he gave me a journal and then the iPhone came out. And so he gave me the phone and he said, you know, and, and, and shoot it. And so that was essentially for me. So I started talking my, my, the work that I got into was very like, it was emotional, but it was devoid of my own emotion because you're, you're taught, taught to, um, taught to be um, unbiased, right? Um, in your own photography uh, when you're doing photojournalism. So that's how I started. But when I got sick and Ben gave me, you know, the iPhone and um, the journal, I didn't have those uh, kind of rules to, ethical rules to follow. So I just poured it all in and initially it was just for me. So that whole body of work um, was just for me and when I started sharing it, even in sharing it in, in among, you know, photojournalism peers, I would have actual editors of like major magazines just like cry and start telling me their story. And I realized that it wasn't just my story, you know, that this story, yeah. that there's something to be said about talking about the universal through the personal. Um, and then the most recent body of work, which you showed, is, um, is of the kids. And that's just really me having fun um, going through um, postpartum depression and, like, kind of trying to pull myself out of it. Um, and because in the original body of work on, on my father's death, I was so open about how I felt. And people really, that really resonated with a lot of people. You know, there's no going back from that. Once you realize that that's your voice and that's how you tell stories, you take that for anything that you do. And so, you know, even with the work that I do now with Ben, even if it's a documentary that we did for, you know, a short little piece we did for Nat Geo, it's very much that voice. Um, yeah. And you can see it because you're going to show that that piece. It's... it's um, and you, you mentioned, you know, writing in a journal. Is that something you continue to do? And how, I mean, most photographers hate writing. And I, it's obviously, it, it's such an important aspect and something that I think all of us need to do. How, what, are you still doing it? Or how important is writing to you? And how would you recommend like a journal to someone? Or what would you recommend to people? I actually don't write in a journal the same way as other people may write in journals. I, even in the psych ward, I'm, in the journals that I wrote, I actually wrote quotes from people. So there's one P I, and you don't have it because Ben didn't give you that body of work. It's Sorry. called, a, <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm just saying, oh, I, I'm not mad. Mad. no, but it's otherwise it would be a, a 13 hour there's episode. Yeah. Right. No, but there was this one quote that I wrote one. in a journal with a crayon. Cause I remember they um, confiscated all the pens from us. Cause someone tried to kill themselves with a, uh, pen um so i wrote it with a burnt sienna crayon burnt sienna. and um and it said time is all i'm ever gonna miss and and i i was very i was very um uh i i was very uh thoughtful about patient confidentiality so i remember just writing the patient's first letter so it was patient g is what yeah. i wrote and so i forgot his name but i remember that on my journal it says patient g and that's how even now I try to not even talk about, you know, this is how I felt and this is what happened that day. I just kind of record conversations or um, quotes and I make note, we actually have recorders in our living room 
because we um, record conversations because I want to be very precise about that, the quote. Yeah. The, um, you, you obviously shooting and sharing your, your, your family and stuff like that. How do you pick and choose? I mean, some of these are such sensitive moments that you're recording. How do you cross that barrier or allow yourself to shoot that? I mean, what's the process of actually saying, oh, I, you know, my dog just died. I'm going to take a picture of my son with a dog. I mean, how do you get to that place? Well, with Ben, I talked to him about it, you know, like, are you okay with me sharing this moment? There was this moment when Ben, I, I think we watched a, a movie about, um, what's his name? Uh, Mr. Rogers. And I remember Ben had that had a really strong emotional reaction to that. And I recorded that and I recorded his quote, but I asked him if I could do that. With my kids, they're of age where I share it with them. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, Ao and my little son will read it and they're like, okay, yeah, you can put that or no, don't put that. You know, sometimes I mean, it's like whenever they say something, we'll really quickly write it down or like, yeah. I'll we definitely hear something, will write it down. Yeah, we'll like I'll hear something that they phone. say and I'll text it to Marvin and be like, he just said this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I think my Ao once said like, oh, daddy, you drive crazy. Mommy is such a gentle driver, you know, but she's still going to die or something. Like it was like, you know, it was a quote like that. And you know, I'll be like, guess what Mateo said? And I think it's one of those things where every kid says interesting things. Yeah, um, we just write we just, it down. We just record like, it. So my process of journaling is really kind of like a reporter. You know, when a reporter yeah. is in the middle there. So that's how I always was. Even in the psych ward, I was always writing down quotes of what people were saying and retaining it in memory. And I would say it over and over. If I didn't have a pen in my hand, I would say it over and over and over. So I would have the exact quote until I got the pen and wrote it down. Um, so these series that we're looking at with the, the quotes and, and, and stuff like that, how did you come get to this and this, this project? And is it, is it just an ongoing one that you're going to keep doing as long as the kids are growing? And is it, uh, because I know you're growing it into, into video and all kinds of stuff, which is fabulous. We'll go into that. But uh, this is just, um, I never really thought of this as a body of work, just like the, you know, the, 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 the one on depression was never really a body of work. Um, until people said that it was a body of work. Um, <laughs> this one, Bon Chai Mama, I didn't really think of it as a body of work. It was kind of like a log, you know, a daily log. And so Ben was like, you know, this is a body of work. You have something here. And I think in, 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 if you look at the website, the website is called thisisalovestory.net because I never got the .com. But in This Is A Love Story, the, the, the nexus really of that is this, you know, is generational trauma, you know, yeah. what, what we carry, the baggage we carry from the past and how we move that forward or how we pass that on to the kids and how we navigate through that. And I think that's the nexus of all the work that I have in, in, in that, um, and this is a love story. I mean, the, the, everybody says, oh, my kids, I think they say interesting things. And, and a lot of kids, they actually don't. Your kids actually really, really do say some amazing things and and it's almost to the point that, that they're they're just old souls and they see things differently and, and and inhabit the world in a different artistic way and, and vision and i, I have watched that. my kids also like sure. caleb also says things like you know um like he'll also say things like oh double excuse me a fart <laughs> thing with that burp you know but then he'll say something really deep like, so many, i do think they have like a bit of the old soul thing but i think part of it is because we talk to them about a lot of things and we've been very yeah. open to them and they hear about news like i remember one night mateo was just like is a golden shower expensive yeah because like really he heard like the stormy daniel stuff and um, he's like stormy daniel's a really good actress you know like um, i was like yeah but and you what's your what's your, your answer well it depends if you're in thailand or new york or <laughs> yeah. yeah so we you know we're, we're very open to them and i think so they maybe even though they're not particularly um you know mature they're they're just adolescents I, I i think that they have a viewpoint that maybe a lot of other children don't so um, what's their understanding of their what's their understanding of covid and how have you explained it with them and how are they coping with it are, are they seeming like it doesn't really change their day that much or is it really kind of like you see a different change or dynamic how are you i think i think uh, very differently Right? Like, I think they're a little sick of being in the house and they obviously can't socialize and there's a bit of a regression with their own, you know, the way they socialize with each other. There's a lot of fighting going on. Um, 
and there's a lot of like you know schoolwork really um, has has suffered, um, you know. But in a way, they've been they've been, and this answers a question from from Richard that came in a little bit ago. They've been working with us when we shoot, and so they are helping us and following in our footsteps. And there are a couple of shots um, in our recent work that Mateo made. And um, look, I don't want them to be photographers because, uh, no. you know, I need them to make money so they can take care of us when we're older. <laughs> um, but um, I, I but, think but if they both, chose to, you would support them, right? Artists. Oh, yeah, oh, 100%. Course, 100%. I think where I really want, <laughs> it, I want to, what yeah. I really want to imbue upon them is that um, to not find any kind of validation um, externally. I think a lot of artists struggle from that and you know you find yourself worth when other people like your work and I think that that is very unhealthy. I think that if they're going to go into the arts, they need to develop a very strong sense of self and self-worth. Yeah. That way they don't vacillate, right? They don't vacillate between oh, I have a lot of fans and I have a lot of likes and I feel good about who I am. And when they don't, they feel bad. And that's- I mean, they already, we already see it on social media where our oldest son is like, oh, I have like two followers or I have three followers. How do I get more? And there's, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, it actually falls back to the journaling because I, I used to keep quite a, quite a thick journal where I do yep. like Polaroid transfers and I would write. And then it got kind of boring. I did it for a year and it was like too hard to keep up every night. But you realize like social media, like Instagram is your journal. So that's your soul where you're journaling every day, just visually. Mm -hmm. And if people don't like it, they don't like you. Like there's this, you know. Yeah, some, and I don't and want I think, them to translate. You're tying your, your self-worth to something that is really not, is kind of worthless, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Question, do you find yourselves in, now that they're at home and not at school and self, you know, on online schooling, have you guys kind of started some new rituals and new things? Or like, how are you dealing with the day to day? Because, you know, normally you wouldn't be spending that much time all together all the time, right? Oh, we're a mess. Yeah. Um, we're, <laughs> like, we're not even going to lie about it. We actually I mean, made a book about how we how are a mess. mess. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, you know, we'll play some video games with them. We'll like binge on Netflix. We cook together. Um, so there are some things that we're trying to do with them. We'll read, we, you know, we want to read at night. It doesn't always, it doesn't always, it doesn't happen. always no, happen. The one thing that did happen is that when we eat, after we eat, we get to, because, you know, they, st they start later in school now. So we get to eat in front of the TV now and watch a little bit of movie. So we've been binging on, you know, these, um, serious shows uh, and we watch it together as a family but they do work with us like when yeah. we have projects they're gonna yeah. work, you know they do work with us and we have like a few things coming up that we can that that they're going to be involved in so yeah and, and, and for some reason like my son my oldest son has a thing about movie making so and he's dyslexic so he asks me to write his script he's in he's in good company einstein da vinci edison rockefeller and myself, all dyslexic. <laughs> I tell him that, except, you know, he's still, he's still at this age where he, um, it was actually critical. Before we got him to that, the school that he's in, before that, he was, um, he would like hit himself in the head and call himself stupid. And, it's, and I understand that. It's, it's the type of thing is everybody, all the teachers think you see things backwards and tell you like, for me, it was like, I had to literally, they were always like write notes and do this. And, and if I wrote, write, wrote notes, I wasn't paying attention to what was said. As soon as I stopped writing notes, I absorbed it all. Like I, I do things that so differently. And when someone tells you like you're different and it's not a scar, you can see an arm that's missing and it's internal in your head. You can't see it. It's so difficult to grasp a hold of that. So that's why I think, uh, and most teachers don't understand what dyslexia is in the first place, which is really kind of sad. And like, to be honest, a lot of the school districts don't want to admit that, uh, you know, children are dyslexic because then they have to pay a certain you amount know, of money. Send them. Yeah. To, so he, he, we found a good school. He's in a private school now. Um, and it's, it's one to four ratio. So it's, oh, great. um, but you know, obviously it's still a struggle. It's not something that just yeah. goes away even after a year of, of private school. No, it's for life. It's for yeah. life. But, uh, boy, yeah. you know, that means he's, he's going to be brilliant and very, very, uh, uh, you know, hands-on with everything, mechanical, artistical, you know, all of that is going to be a yeah. huge thing. <laughs> he, he did find, <laughs> find my makeup kit. Uh, I don't know if you've seen my Instagram stories. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So now we're going to go into uh, this series. Yeah, so um, I kind of at this time when we were giving up um, – you know, war zone work and there wasn't I had the opportunity once I was with Sony to, to kind of experiment and um, I, I had started getting assignments back in like 2015 that were more adventure kind of stuff yeah. and I think it went underwater for one assignment and it kind of changed my life and I realized how much I enjoyed. was it an opportunity that came to you or was it one like no I really want to get underwater and start doing this I, like, no, I, I, I had an assignment for the New York Times magazine and there was an opportunity for it to get to do an underwater shoot. And when I, I was just enthralled and it was totally different experience for me um, and I really enjoyed it. And then I pushed myself to do more of that. And, you know, unfortunately there's not a ton of underwater work unless you're working for geographic or like really established. It's, it's, it's a hard kind of genre to get into um, and it's expensive, but I, I, I really feel fulfilled like you know f there you know part of after war zone photography but always part of it is like there's this fear where i've always been afraid in a way to take photos of people and like i battle it when i have a camera but i love being underwater and there's there's no um it's just enjoyable to me like i don't care about how people feel about the image because it's experiential as well yeah, yeah. So it, it was a very new thing for me to do and i really really got into it and in a way like i didn't have any influences in the same way marvie didn't have any influences when she got in to, to photojournalism i never looked at underwater work i didn't know what a good underwater image was and so i really kind of started out my learning curve is just on my own and, and deciding okay the same kind of compositional elements that i use above water i'll bring to underwater you know and and hopefully that'll work so, I mean, uh, obviously... Can I, can I just, can, can yeah. I just interject, Travis? Because I'm still looking at this photo, but how would you feel with your kids following your footsteps? I, and I said, you know, I, I said something about, like, the external validation. Um, I also want to say that if they do decide to do that, I would tell them to take a business class first. Yeah. <laughs> well, <yes. laughs> <Before> they, <laughs> not even just a business class, just just major in business. And they, you could just do whatever it is that art that you want, but just, like, have a core curriculum of business is what I That's would. That's one of the smartest things you could teach them because I'm, I, when I, like, luckily I went from doing everything before photography. I used to work in film and TV and then I own nightclubs and bars in New York and Miami and Connecticut. And I got this business background, but when I went back to school at ICP, uh, you know, I went for a one year of general studies. They never talked about business once. I mean, that no one teaches you how to be a most, photographer, how to do it. It's the most important thing. Like, you know, photography is important. But yeah. if you're, a, you know, you're your own that. small business, you got to learn how to do that. And most people, most of the programs, they just shove out people who know how to photograph or know how to, like, develop a roll of 35 with, you know, Rodinol. I mean, uh, and then, you know, whatever. I mean, I have, and, <laughs> and have no idea how to, like send out a bid or get a PO or, or write our, their usage. Or I have, or. I, I mean, I have dear, you know, I, like I have a dear friend, we joke about it. I'm not going to say his name, but we joke with him about it because, you know, he's really this established amazing photographer and he sent us, um, it wasn't on, on a dock, but it was on an Excel that you could like, you could fudge. Uh, at first it wasn't a dock, but his, No, his, first it was like just on an email. He, like, sent I us an, it was an, an email, but then I was like, is there, you know, like, is there an invoice number? And it was one of those things where, like, oh, my God, like, this is something that journalism classes or photo classes just never taught. Like how, like, to, how to streamline how to invoice, your business. How to, yep. how to bid, any of that stuff. Like, and I think it's part of, 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 it's part of the work that I had to relearn. I mean, I had to learn on my own. As we, as, as we, we, as we progress. As we develop yeah. and, and, and speak about learning, I mean, you're, you're taking shots that people that spent their whole lives underwater would be jealous of getting like, and, and you're saying you self taught yourself, like, how do you dive in and suddenly, excuse the double entendre, dive in and actually really start figuring out, all right, I'm going to start, you know, looking underwater houses, I'm going to figure out lighting, I'm going to figure out like, you know, how do you get to I, a point? I'm, I, I just do like, I, I yeah. have never had that problem of, of, of just diving, whether it was 
going straight into war photography or going straight into doing sports or, you know, going doing, you know, underwater uh, work. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where I just jump in and figure out as I do it and take, you know, whatever my, where my talents are visually, which I don't take for granted, um, and, and, and really apply them to every situation that I'm in. But also photography is just one of those things that you can't really study unless you do it, right? Yeah, it's I mean, like it's, basketball. You have to like you just practice have to constantly. And, and, you know, some people are innately good and some people need to really work hard. Um, and I think I definitely, just because of the way I grew up, I have some innate right. artistic, you know, sensibilities where I see the world as a composition all the time. Like, even if I was looking at Marvie now and, you know, I would put her yeah. head, I would, you know, did you just, no, but like, I, I, even when I'm talking to someone, you know, I will make sure there's no like tree growing out of their head. I like shift, like, it, it's just like part of, of how I, I look at the world uh, uh, like that. That was, um, the, the sharks were both open. Whoa, but the great whites, it was a cage. Uh, it was in a cage. Uh, the first time I left the cage. Uh, when that was legal to do. And then uh, the rest of the time we've been uh, in the cage. Yeah, with the kids, uh, definitely. Yeah, we actually took, we just cage. dunked uh, when they were. Um, the you kids. chum the kids, what? <laughs> when they were seven and eight, they both went into uh, the cage with great whites. Was that like one of the most exciting experiences for them? Did they fully grasp it all? or? No, yeah. no they like got out and be like, can we go watch Jaws? <laughs> And then we took them to Legoland when we docked. And, and they, they were said, like, oh, this is the best <laughs> ever. And, and we were just like, what? Really? You just sweat, like, you're like the youngest kid to like. Not the youngest. The, the owner, second of, youngest. The, the owner yeah. of the boat actually had a five-year-old. All right. So. It's time to dive into something else uh, here. I gotta say, I've seen that so many times now, and every time I watch it, I tear up, I laugh, I cry. Even now, I'm fucking emotional, like ridiculous. Like, it is brings me back to like being a little kid watching like Disney and uh, uh, on Sunday nights with my dad and Mutual Omaha Kingdom. It's so beautiful. Like, how does this? I mean, thank you for putting that together and exposing your family that way. And and when you say your kids aren't special my god you say inappropriate <laughs> like, yeah, like isn't that crazy no i've been a little inappropriate it doesn't come out of most kids mouths <laughs> well i think um well they're also growing up in this age where those you know kids we have to make sure that our kids are very aware of these things at an early age right um yeah. so we pound that on them all the time like even with ben you know um like caleb likes to give ben a purple knuckle and even ben will be like hey caleb i did not you're gonna go to jail yeah i did <laughs> not you, do that. you will go to jail if you do that like we our kids basically think that if they do something wrong they're either gonna die or go to jail yeah like <laughs> even <laughs> us like as as a you know a, a, a boy who grew up and you know this man in, in, in this age like there's some things which are you know we take for granted in the way we act or the way we treat other people and it, yeah. it's some of the words that we say and I think I have to unlearn that so I can make better you know boys in, in, into better men 